All right, good afternoon, folks. Today we're going to be looking at a passage of scripture. If you have your Bibles with you, could you turn to 1 John chapter 4? And while you do that, um, yeah, well, actually, let's re- let's start by reading the passage. Let's. Um, there's a lot in this passage. It's very wordy. It's honestly a difficult passage, but we're going to read it, and we're going to see what God can say to us through it. Um, yeah, let's read God's word. Um, this is the word of the Lord. Let's read from verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, If God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Okay, there's a lot of repetition in there. There's a lot of almost poetry in there. And if you didn't pick it all up, don't worry, we're going to go through it. Um, For now, I hope you just appreciate the beauty. uh, The the main thing, which is that God uh, loves us. And if we love one another, we will abide in him. I wonder... um, today what word stuck out to you as I read that. As I read that, the one word that stuck out to me is abide. And that's the word I'm going to be focusing on. Um, And that's the word I'm going to be trying to to break down. Let's, um, yeah, let me read what I have here. I want you to imagine for a second that you're a a child back in primary school. You're um, on the playground. You've, uh, it's, it's the first few years of primary school. You're working out how to make friends. You have a, uh, someone comes across to you and they open a little bag of Harry Bows and they eat one and they give you one and you take it and you eat it uh, and you feel a little sense of happiness and you know that there's a friendship there. There's something, there's something there. You're learning how to make friends and then later on you, your, your mum gives you a, um, a little packet of, I don't know, Cadbury stars or something and you, you eat one and then you remember your friend and you go and you go and you give them one, and it's reciprocated. Okay, this is this is this is friendship. Um, that kind of friendship is a beautiful thing, and it's something that we've all experienced to some degree or another. I want you to imagine uh, another example. Um, let's take King Charles, the, the current king. When he has a, a relationship with someone, um, someone might open a bag of Harry Bows and give him one, or or, or the equivalent. But King Charles may also always have the niggling doubt that it's because he's king. It's because of his position that someone is friends with him. 
And as we think about this word abide, we're going to be thinking about the relationship we have to God. Um, is he a friend? Like the, the, the play, play school friend? Is he a king? Uh, well, this, this passage is going to tell us more about our relationship with Jesus Christ. What it is... Um, uh, yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask two questions. I'm going to answer two questions. That, um, I keep wanting to say this morning, this afternoon. The first question is, what is this relationship that we have with God? Is it, uh, is it the relationship of um, a subject to King Charles? Is it the relationship of a, a play school child to another? another? Um, or is it something completely different? And then the second question I'm going to answer is, how do we have confidence that this relationship is real? And I think that these two questions are, are what John is writing. Um, actually, at the end of his book, he says, um, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. He's writing to Christians to give them confidence in their belief. Um, so let's answer the first question. Let's start with the first question. What is this relationship? Okay, I'm going to use some very bad orating tactics here and tell you the answer immediately and then we'll go into it. Um, let me tell you this. The defining characteristic that you have as a Christian is the love that the Godhead has for you. Let me repeat that. The defining characteristic that you have as a Christian is the love of God for you. It's not anything to do with you. It's actually the love of someone else. It's the love of God for you. Romans 5.8. Let me read Romans 5.8. I think it's a, a verse that you all know. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This verse doesn't say, while we were still sinners, God developed a love for us. Or it doesn't say, um, it's not just ideological compassion, it's not just some... It says, well, God showed his love for us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is ridiculous, crazy love. But in our very worst selves, he already loved us. There's, you could preach a sermon on that one verse alone, but the only one thing I want you to hold from that verse uh, is that, that this, this love um, was before you did anything. It was, it was chosen by him. He didn't, you didn't do anything to earn it. He just loved you. Okay? Does that alone make it the defining characteristic? Uh, I don't, maybe not. Um, but let's ask an, ex an expert. Because I'm not an expert, let's ask an expert. John the Apostle really was an expert on love. He wrote at least four books of the New Testament. Um, here's a man who walked and talked with Jesus. He witnessed the miracles. He saw the power of Jesus' teaching. Um, he met the risen Lord after seeing him crucified. <coughs> with Jake, I hear you cry. Jake. Uh, the same could be said of 11 other men. He was one of the apostles. Why should we listen to, to John over them? Well, I think John had a unique perspective on the subject of love. I don't think it's a coincidence that he was given the role of writing 1 John, which is effectively just a big essay on love. Um, in John 13, when John is dining with the Twelve at the Last Supper, Jesus gives some teaching, but right in the middle of that teaching, there's a verse, um, verse 23 says, One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining against his feet. Um, that's a very strange verse, just in among all the teaching. Um, and we know from other passages that that disciple is John who writes this book. Here's a, here's a disciple who had a special love with Jesus. And more than that, the, he, Jesus loved him so much that a rumor spread that he would never ever die. Um, this, is, this is how much Jesus loved John. Also, John is a very loving person himself. Uh, look at some of the language he uses. Paul called his readers things like friends and brothers. But John says... Beloved, that's how he refers to people. Beloved, one who is loved. He's talking about himself. He loves his readers, but also he knows how much God loves them. He knows that the defining characteristic of his readers, of you as a Christian, is that you are loved. 
Now, as I say, the entire book of 1 John is an essay on love and how it should affect our lives. We're going to focus on chapter 4 and see what John has to say about this defining love for us. Verse 7, uh, and as I read these verses, I'm going to read a number of verses here, and I would, I would encourage you as, you, as you have your Bibles, um, don't take what I say for granted. Read, read the verse. I, I have, I'm pretty much just reading scripture and trying to make it a more understandable for us. So um, listen to John, not me here, okay? Verse 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. All love is from God. So love is from God. I, I think this is, I love this. I think this is um, kind of like the boss at McDonald's is trying to say that uh, he, it's only taking credit for preparing every Big Mac that has ever been prepared. It's, it's not possible. It's, it seems kind of silly. There are hundreds of thousands of people who went into making that Big Mac from the, you know, the, the start to the finish. But some, for some reason, the CEO is claiming he was fully responsible. This is counterintuitive. It's not. Um, it's not very understandable for us in our in our modern world. Um, I would really like it to say, um, God's love is God's love. My love is my love. And maybe my love is inspired by God. You know, but it's not God's love. It's my love. When I love my family, that's. that's um, but that's not what it says. Let me read the verse again. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love has not been born of God. People who love, they're from God. Very clear. People who do not love, they're not from God. This is, a, this is really, really clear. This is black and white. Uh, honestly, this doesn't tell us much about what it looks like to love. Um, but it does tell us that this love is a stamp, it's a signet ring. If you are owned by God, if you're in God, you will love one another. It's a, uh, yeah. This is really important, that we know this love and that we share this love. If you're wondering what value there is to, what value there is to helping someone across the road, or why you should want to help with the dishes when you've already done your fair share that week, or uh, why you keep on after your shift just because the last customer won't leave. Um, if you're wondering why you want to do these things with a smile on your face, it's because Christ is in you. It's God's love in you. Uh, we won't always do these things. Sometimes the sinful nature will win out. But um, when it happens, when you show love, remember that that is Christ in you. Be encouraged that that is the stamp, that is God's signet ring on you, saying, you are mine, this is my love within you, that's letting you do those things, and, and take comfort from that. Uh, before we go any further, I feel we need to address the, just how difficult John is when he writes. Um, it's, it's kind of a trademark of his. He wrote, he wrote four books, all four of them are just uh, almost poetry. He's, he's just a very awkward writer. Let's take probably his most famous passage as an example, John 1. Um, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness is not overcome it. He just jumps from idea to idea. I, honestly, there's no way you picked up everything that just said, I've read that passage half a dozen times when preparing for this, and even when I was reading it there, I missed half a dozen things. It's just like idea, 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 idea. Very difficult to understand. Here he says, Jesus is the word. Jesus is God. Jesus is light, whatever that means. Uh, that he was the tool for creation. That he was there before creation. And all in the space of a tiny paragraph. Um, but he says it in a poetic way. And I think there's, there's a certain beauty in that. And again, as, even as we come to the, to the passage we're trying to look at here. I want, you to, I want you to see the poetry in it. I want you to um, appreciate that. First John is exactly the same. The next little bit uh, is a little bit of a, uh, a difficult uh, logic diagram that, that John has. And I'm going to try and make this as understandable as possible. Let's, let's read a few verses 
and as I say, appreciate the poetry in it. Don't worry too much about trying to get the connections. Um, yeah, let's read a few of these verses. Chapter 2, verse 24. We're going to jump back just a little bit here. It says, Let what you learned from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise he made to us. Eternal life. Then he goes on to say, By this we know love, that he laid down his love his life for us. Um, and he goes on, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. And if we love one another, then God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. And lastly, he finishes off, off the argument by wrapping up back up in the word abide. He says, God is love. Whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Are you confused? I just fired off those verses. My point, my point isn't to expositionally go through each one. It's simply that John is a difficult poetic writer. Um, yeah, honestly, I read this about half a dozen times before I was able to see what John was saying. Jake, why not just paraphrase the point he's making? Well, I don't really trust myself to word it without losing something. So I want to, I want to read what John is saying, and I, I'm actually going to read those verses again, try and... Um, so that we can try and understand it. Um, and I'll try to point out the links. But yeah, as I say, in, in, enjoy these verses and read them again. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. That's you and me. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you will abide in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise that he made to us. Eternal life. Um, verse chapter 3 verse 16 then says by this we know love that he laid down his life for us that's what we heard in the beginning the gospel John expands from Christ equals love now and he goes beloved if God so loved us then we ought to love one another and why does it matter well chapter, verse 12 says if we love one another then God abides in us and his love is perfected in us the gospel proves Jesus equals love. If Jesus equals love, we should love one another. And if Jesus equals love, if we love one another, then God abides in us and we abide in him. It's, it's, it's a beautiful picture, this, this idea that an action that we have is an attribute of God. It's, and it, it's, like, it's like a proof that he's there. It's, it's a, a truly beautiful thing. Let's take a step back from there, and um, um, we'll come back to that idea. But I want to really focus on this word abide, um, and have a think about it. Let's see if it's a very obvious word, or if there's more to it than, than just meets the eye. John steals this word directly from Jesus. Jesus uses this long before John ever does. Uh, in John chapter... What does he say this? Yes, in his teaching at the Last Supper, um, he talks about abiding. Um, to abide by a person's will is to actively submit, to actively go by what they desire. Think about, let's think about the child in the playground again. Um, if the child is the teacher's pet, he'll abide by the teacher's rules. He will wear the uniform, he'll listen to what he says, if he's not the teacher's pet, if he stops respecting and loving the teacher, then he won't listen. He may not wear the uniform, he may run away. Even if he does wear the uniform, uh, maybe his parent forces him to, you still wouldn't call that abiding, more like being forced to or putting up with. The word abide suggests willful desire willful submission. In 1 John 4, uh, there's even more intimate language than this picture that I've just given. Um, it's not a picture of a child abiding by Jesus' rules or by Jesus. No, it says, God is love. Whoever abides in love abides in God himself, and God abides in him. Abides in God. That's a total merging of wills. 
That's a surrender. If you abide in God and He in you, He becomes your source, your life. When John's readers heard this, their minds would jump straight to something the Lord said when eating the Last Supper. Um, and I want to read, take time to read this passage um, where Jesus uses the word um, abide. And I think this kind of defines the word abide. Um, again, it's written by John, more poetry, um, but let the words soak over you and, and, and pick up the, the meaning behind it. Um, Jesus says this to his disciples, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the words I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, Neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is who bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Abiding is letting Christ be the vine, and us the branch. We gain everything from him, the source of water, and nutrients, the fruit of is Christ's fruit, it's the vine's fruit. We don't look at a tree and say, that's a nice apple that that apple branch has produced. No, we look at it and we say, there's a nice apple that that tree has produced. Our very achievements become Christ's. Let's drag this right back to the question we asked at the beginning. What is this relationship we have with Jesus? Well, is that of the loved child? Is that of the abiding branch. The gospel is Jesus giving us life, showing us what love is, and even though we're the ones that benefit from the love, the love we're the beneficiaries, if you will, it's the whole point is about God's love, not us. And so I repeat my initial statement. The defining characteristic that you have as a Christian is God's love for you. Okay, I think we've dealt with the first point. Let's um, take a little bit of time to deal with the second point. This is, um, the first question was, what is the nature of this relationship? The second is, um, how do we have confidence that this relationship is real? And this is really where John comes into his own. This is where, this is the reason he wrote his book, let alone this chapter, I think is why he wrote this book. Okay, we've already touched on one reason for this. The first is that the signet ring that stamps you as gods is that we love one another. That is in itself a reason why you should have confidence that you are abiding in Christ. He says that if we love one another, then God abides in us. There's a proof. If you love one another, you should have confidence that God is abiding in you and you're abiding in God. Uh, but I'm going to suggest that there are four other reasons. Five reasons in total, and I'm just going to quickly jump through them. These are not... Um, these are not long points. Five reasons why you should have confidence that you are abiding in Christ and he's abiding in you. And let me challenge you, if you do not feel this, don't worry, don't worry. Ask him to abide within you and he will come. He is willing, he loves you. My first reason is this. In verse 13 it says, By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. So reason one is the Holy Spirit, a divine helper, someone who gives us assurance of the relationship. Um, this point isn't really provable, I'm not gonna dwell on it, um, but I can testify to the assurance that the spirit gives to me. That's reason one. Reason two is the power and truth of the gospel itself. That's the power and truth of the gospel itself. Verse uh, 14 says, And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Now for this point, admittedly, we are not John. So when John says this, he genuinely walked, saw, and testified to what Jesus did. So you could argue that this is maybe not for us, but 
the verse does say we, and I think John is including us in this. Uh, how do we know the truth of the gospel? Well, historical accuracy of the New Testament, the martyrdom of the apostles, the outrageous claims of Jesus. Um, the students, you guys have just done a series on apologetics. You, you will know that there are other reasons, apart from the, purely the assurance of the Holy Spirit, as to why you can trust in God's word. And I think this is what um, this is what John is getting at when he says we have seen and testified that, that the gospel has taken place. So reason one is um, the Holy Spirit. Reason two is the power and truth of apologetics, the, the, the power and truth of the gospel itself, the, the, our testimony to the gospel. Reason three uh, is the promise that Jesus gives multiple times, and John repeats here. It's this promise here. Whoever confesses that Jesus, Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him. If you have confessed him as Lord, then you abide. That's a promise. As you sit here, analyze your heart. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? If you do, then that itself should give you confidence in your position before God. Reason three is your confession before God. Reason four comes in, in verse 16, and we've looked at this one already. God is love, and whoever abides in the love abides in God, and God abides in him. Lots of words, but again, this idea that if we love one another, God is abiding in us. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. It's another promise. This is not some ideal. If you love one another, God abides in you. And on to the last reason. Um, this is reason five, and it's perhaps the hardest reason. It's the last one that John gives, and he spends the longest on it, so I'm going to spend just a, just a little bit longer on it. Still not long. John says that because God has perfected his love in you, you should have confidence in the last day. He goes on to say that this perfect love casts out fear. The implication being, if you have no fear, then you can be confident that he abides in you. Let me, let me read uh, the verses that, that say this. Um, and I encourage you to, to read this along with me, to try and understand this along with me. Whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, by this loving of each other, is love perfected within us, so that we can have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. He is confident in the last day, so we should be confident. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. And here we have another one of John's poetic little confusing word loops. He says, love is perfected in abiding relationship, and this is what gives us confidence. Um, as we rest in him, we accept our position as the branch, Jesus' position as the vine, and in that, the love becomes perfect and fear will fade. It's cause and effect. As we abide, it ends the fear which cannot be in the presence of, the, of perfect love. As Jesus, as we allow Jesus to be the, the vine, as we allow him to be the source, the fear fades. I think it would be very easy to read that and go, I'm fearful, I don't experience um, God's love. I think that's why this is a difficult verse. I was thinking about this even as I was standing up and I was preparing, you know? Yeah, there was a little flutter of nerves. Am I, am I thinking that, um, that God doesn't abide in me? No, I'm not. Because as I've been reading, as, as I've been reading his word, as I focused on how much he loves me, the fear has faded. There is no place for a true understanding of God's love and fear within your heart. Because he is so much more powerful than our fear. Um, yeah, there, there are two lessons from this. The first is if you want to be less fearful, learn to abide. Give him control of your life. Realize your love for your friends and family isn't your own. It's from God. It's God's love through you. We love because he first loved us. 
And the second reason is that if you see trust in God changing your life, casting out fear, like I just gave the example there a second ago as we're standing up, well, then that is itself proof that you're abiding in Jesus. And I want you to use that as, as confidence, as another reason. That is the fifth reason, that love casts out fear. To sum up, and with this I finish, what is the relationship we have with God? It's one of being loved by Him. It's abiding in love. Us in God, He in us. How do we have confidence in that relationship? I, well, I give five reasons for that. The first one was the assurance of the Holy Spirit. The second reason was the reliability of testimony of the Gospels. And the eyewitness testimony of others. The third is the promise of confession. Whoever confesses Jesus is the Lord, as Lord, God abides in him. The fourth reason is that signet ring stamp of love. Loving others equals God loving us and abiding in us. The fifth reason is the transforming work of God's love, the casting out of fear, the evidence of God's love. Maybe some of what I've said today is a little bit confusing. I don't know. Um, the dream team of myself and John the Apostle leads to a, a, quite a confusing sermon, I think. But it's my prayer you'll go home today with more confidence than you had before um, that the, uh, of the love that God has for you, that you will seek to abide in Him and let Him abide in you. And hopefully, and it's my prayer for you guys, that His love will be perfected in you. Let's uh, sing a song that really is an answer to this passage. Um, if your heart is filled with the love that God has for us, then let's pour that back out as a prayer to God. Let's give it back um, to God who loves us. This song, when I first read this passage, it jumped immediately to mind. It's, it's called Abide, um, and it's, it's the word that is the, the center of this passage. Let's um, worship together and let's um, sing to the God who abides in us.